Jesus' plan for your life, for your flourishing and for the restoration of this world is simply your life and His Spirit. Good morning. Why don't you turn to someone and say something significant is going to happen today. Amen. Amen. It does not take that long to say those few words. Okay. Picture the scene. Picture the scene. The disciples are gathered around Jesus. We are somewhere between the Last Supper and the Garden of Gethsemane. There must be some sense of dread in the air. Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem. The crowds have gathered around him. They've cried, Hosanna, and you have seen the anger in the Pharisees' eyes. Judas has just walked out after some sort of conversation with Jesus. Peter has been told that he will deny Jesus. Stuff with Jesus was always intense, but there must have been something about these hours that felt different. And then into that moment, Jesus utters the words, probably the words you most want him to not say, I am going away. And not only that, but he says, it is good that I am going away. Can you imagine being a disciple in that moment? You have left everything. You've left your livelihood, your families. You've given everything to follow this man day and night to go everywhere that he goes. And then suddenly, after three years, he says, I'm leaving. And then he has the audacity to even say, it is good. It's good that I am going away. And why does he say that? Because his promise is that if he goes away, someone else will come. The Spirit will come. And to Jesus, that is a better promise. I'd love you to be honest this morning. How many people here would trade their current experience of the Spirit for your whole life for just one hour in the flesh, a cappuccino date with Jesus? And yet Jesus says this is the better way. He doesn't say it's necessary. It doesn't say it's required. He says it's good that I go away. And that is because Jesus' plan for your life, for your flourishing and for the restoration of this world is simply your life and his spirit. Your life and his spirit. And that is the better promise. And so as we go through today and we look at the Holy Spirit, I would love you to grapple with those words of Jesus. Hold on to them. Take them seriously. Resist the temptation to relegate it to hyperbole or religious rhetoric and ask this question, what if Jesus was right? What if better is truly possible? If you have a Bible there, would you turn to Acts 2 with me? We're going to be reading from verse 1 as we carry on this Acts series. And it's a passage that you know well. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And so this is a familiar passage. We read it every year on the day of Pentecost. And the danger with that, as with all things that get repeated, they can lose their potency. But like Peter said last week, this story of Acts is the story of the church's staggering advancement to the center of the civilized world. This church that turned the world upside down. And that story, everything we're going to study for the next seven weeks, only makes sense if we understand this moment and the arrival of the Spirit of God. 
But what really happened? What is really going on in this room which is so decisive for the rest of time? Well, Pentecost is like this crescendo moment where thousands of years of promises and God's action and biblical themes and foreshadows all collide together in a glorious eruption. And like any great crescendo, any great piece of music, you can only really appreciate the full weight of it when you journey to what got you there. You sit in the moment. You experience the build-up until finally you get that great crescendo which overtakes you. And so today... I'd love us to walk the road to Pentecost. We're going to do a whistle-stop tour through about a couple of hundred thousand years, all the way back to the beginning of creation. And this will not be a comprehensive overview of the Holy Spirit, but it will hopefully be enough for you to experience the richness and weightiness of everything that we've just read. And we're going to do that on the Bible's own terms. We're going to discuss the Holy Spirit in terms of fire, and of wind. And understanding the Bible on its own terms is really important, and it can be hard. As Hannah, a decade of theological training, uh, pointed out to me this week, us trying to understand the Bible today is like someone in 2,000 years getting confused between a butt dial and a booty call. Right? You can just imagine people in 2,000 years trying to get their head around some of those messages. And so we have to understand where language It paints a picture. It meant something in a time. And our job is to try and understand what it meant so that it comes to our life for us fresh today. And so fire. Let's start with fire. And we're going to be moving fairly quickly through a lot of biblical history. And so we won't be able to camp out for too long. But we will be giving your notes through the Emmaus Way to your collectives. And so I encourage you to go back and sit with these passages that I'm going to be talking through today. But let us start with the Exodus. So much of biblical imagination starts with the Exodus, the moment in which God's people escape from Egypt. And we, are, we hear in Exodus that the presence of God comes as a pillar of smoke and a pillar of fire. And it protects them from the Egyptian armies. They cross the Red Sea and it leads them through the wilderness. Until importantly, we read Exodus 33 that it comes to rest on a tent. It comes to rest in one geographical location. And that one place in this tent becomes the literal place, the only place where the presence of God resides on earth. And the Bible gives a very important name for that place, the tabernacle. Later it gets called the temple. There's a a picture of it, this moment in which the pillar of fire comes down and it rests on the tent. And the presence of God was so thick in that place that right in the very center, right at the the epicenter of the presence of God, no person could go. No human could go except for one priest on one day of the year called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, where they could go into the Holy of Holies, the very center of God's presence. And even then, they would have a rope tied to their leg in case they died in the presence of God and had to get dragged out so they weren't met a year later by the next high priest. And so we have this moment, the tabernacle, where the literal presence of God's rest. So we've got Exodus. Now we jump forward and we get to Solomon. There's now kings have been established in the people of God. David's son, Solomon, is mandated to build the temple. What was a tent has become a more concrete structure, a place for the presence of God. And just like with the temple, we read in 1 Kings 8, when the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled and the temple of the Lord. And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Then Solomon said, the Lord has said that he would dwell in a dark cloud. I have indeed built a magnificent temple for you, a place for you to dwell forever. So again, Solomon Uh, He consecrates the, the temple to the Lord and again this pillar of fire, this pillar of cloud lands as another geographical location, a place for the presence of God. So I want you to picture it. Pillar of fire above a tent, 
pillar of fire above a temple. This is the place. The temple became the center of the city and it was the place for the presence of the Lord to come. Okay, so now we jump through to Pentecost and what happens? Fire arrives, but this time it's not one pillar. What is it? Many tongues. Many tongues that come and they they stand above what? People. That is what's so important about Pentecost. What used to be one pillar, one place for the presence of the God, marking the tabernacle. Now many comes, many tongues of fire come and they rest above the believers. Marking out again the literal dwelling place of the Lord here on earth, inside people. What was one pillar has become many tongues because the tabernacle is moving out of the building. And what we see is this foreshadowed in the life of Jesus. In John 1, it says this, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That word dwelling there is skeneno. Skeneno. And it literally means the tabernacle. So what that verse is literally saying is that the word became flesh. Jesus became flesh and he tabernacled among us. What do we see in the life of Jesus? We see that just before he starts his earthly ministry, he is baptized in the Jordan. He comes out of it. We hear the voice of the Father and the Spirit descend like a dove and rest upon him. Jesus tabernacled with the anointing of the Spirit among us. And then Jesus went about doing all kinds of things that got him in trouble. He went around telling people their sins were forgiven. Well, hold on. There's one place where your sins get forgiven. Where? The temple. And suddenly Jesus, outside of the temple, was having the audacity to go and forgive sins. Well, Jesus isn't removing the forgiveness of sins from the temple. What's Jesus doing? He's renegotiating where the temple is. Suddenly the temple isn't one place. Suddenly the temple has moved out and Jesus goes about doing temple business everywhere because he is renegotiating and redefining where the dwelling place of the divine is here on earth. So Jesus was the foreshadow of what it was to be a walking, talking temple. And then at Pentecost, what happens? Tongues of fire that mark the temple come and rest on who? Me and you. And so what are we called to do? We're called to walk around as walking, talking, dwelling places of the divine. Later on, Paul picks this up in 1 Corinthians 3. And he says this, don't you yourselves know you are God's temple? The reason that the language there is a bit clumsy in the English, you yourselves, is because in ancient Greek, there's two words for you. There's singular, singular you, as in you, Hannah, you, Peter, but there's also plural you. There's all of you. And what Paul is saying here is it's the plural you. Don't you, you know that you yourselves are the temple of God. So not only has the one believer become the dwelling place of God, but the church together is held together as the temple, the spirit that binds us together. Don't you yourselves know that at Pentecost something happened? That what used to be one pillar became many tongues and rested on each person and together we are bound by the spirit as literal walking, talking, dwelling places of the divine. So fire, right? You with me? Got fire. Okay, now wind. What's going on with wind? Well, wind goes all the way back to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. Now this word spirit there is ruach. You've got really like it's guttural. As me and Peter were talking about this this week, it led us to do um, impressions of orcs from Lord of the Rings because it's kind of that like man flesh. Okay, guttural. Okay, can you say it with me? Ruach. Yeah, that's it. Ruach. And the definition for ruach in Hebrew is literally this: it's spirit, or it's wind, or it's breath. And so we go from Genesis 1, 
we see the breath of God, the spirit of God. And we jump all the way through to Genesis 2 verse 7 and it says this, God formed man from the dust of the ground and what? And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. So here God sets man apart among all of the creation by breathing, breathing his spirit into him. And then he calls them to do what? To go and be creative just like he is creative. To multiply and to cultivate God's good world. So Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Now jump forward to about 600 BC and we get the prophet Ezekiel. Now, prophets in the Old Testament are foreshadows of the normal Christian life when the Spirit inhabits and anoints the believer. And so prophets in the Old Testament would be these people who the Spirit would rest on at certain times and for certain roles. And they would speak the Spirit of God. And so Ezekiel, we know the story well. Ezekiel is brought to the valley of dry bones. And God says to him, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, God, you alone know. And then God calls him to do what? He says, prophesy and command these bones to live. And in Ezekiel 37.10, we read, so I prophesied, I spoke as he commanded, and breath entered them, and they came to life. So what's happening? Genesis 1, the spirit hovers over creation. Genesis 2, God breathes his spirit and man comes to life. Ezekiel 37, God then calls Ezekiel to do what God did. And he breathes and he speaks life into the valley of dry bones. Now we jump forward all the way to John 20. The resurrection has happened. Jesus has come back and he says this. Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them. And said, receive the Holy Spirit. The breath of God. Genesis, Ezekiel, John, Acts 2. The wind, the spirit, the ruach of God arrives again. And then what happens? They receive the Holy Spirit and what do they do? They burst out of the upper room and immediately they begin to proclaim They begin to speak the good news. And what do they do? They begin to create new creation. They begin to speak a new church into being. Their words are anointed with divine presence, just as in Genesis, just as in Ezekiel. And they proclaim through the Spirit and they bring the church to life. Now, this is a slightly cliched thing, but it helped me, and so I'm going to show it to you. Okay, so if you turn your eyes to the screen, this is where my mind goes. Kitty, kitty, kitty. <laughs> that was it? <laughs> Do it again. If you ever come near my son again. Oh, this is this is your son. Oh, yours. <laughs> Did you know that? No, me. I, I didn't know. No. Did you? No, of course not. No. Ed? <laughs> Doodles. And I think that captures a little bit of what I'm talking about. Like maybe you feel small, you feel backed into a corner with only a pitiful little meow. But the truth is that your voice carries the very breath of God, the spirit, the ruach of God, the same spirit that birthed creation, the same spirit that formed muscle and ligament on a valley of dry bones, the same spirit that empowered Jesus to heal the blind and the lame and the leper. The meow becomes a roar. After that, the Lion King goes into all sorts of weird, sort of pantheistic places. So please leave the theology there. After that, Circle of Life and all that, Elton is good at writing a timeless ballad, but his theology is completely flawed. So, but what if Jesus was right? What if better is truly 
available? What if, as a church, we began to believe that our voice carries the same spirit, the same spirit that Ezekiel had, the same spirit that hovered over creation, the same spirit that Jesus breathed on as the disciples. You can always tell how much someone believes in the power of the spirit by how careful they are with their words. Because as you truly begin to believe that your, your voice carries power. Last week, it's a little story, but we had a word shared up here about someone who something good had happened. And then suddenly they were just feeling this sort of oppressive weight that they couldn't shift. And uh, we prayed for that. And I got a text in the week and it said this, after an incredible life changing day on Friday, I had been feeling a real weight and sense of fear that neither my heart nor my head could explain. I just felt like running from everything. But as you prayed, I knew God was speaking directly to me. And as the verses of Timothy were read, I felt the heaviness completely lift. Praise God. And so what happens is we see you move from the story of Acts, from the upper room. And over the the next seven weeks, what we're going to see is we're going to see the church speaking and acting and bringing a new creation into being. That's what we're going to study. That's what we're going to look at. That's what we're going to be inspired by. And that's what we're going to be challenged to embody together. And what does that new world look like? Well, Jesus shows us that in his first ever sermon. It says he sets down and he opens the scroll of Isaiah and he reads this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. The Spirit has a mission. The Spirit has an agenda and he anoints people towards the purposes of God. This is one of the reasons that we are relentlessly committed to getting a new lighthouse established. Why? Because the opening line of Jesus' ministry, the opening line after you are anointed with the Spirit is to what? To proclaim good news to the poor. Do you remember when we looked at Revelation and we talked about how in Genesis it says that the Spirit hovered over the waters? And then in Revelation we hear that there is no sea. And all the sort of salt water seekers out there are like gutted about that. Like what about surfing and all of that thing. And, we, and it's the sea in the biblical imagination is this place of darkness and chaos and disorder. So what it's saying is in Revelation, there will be no place of darkness and chaos and disorder. But what if the spirit, the same spirit in Genesis that hovered over those places, that's still the place where the spirit wants to hover over today? But now the Spirit's in you. And so where's the Lord going to call you to? To places of darkness and chaos and disorder. To bring his order and his beauty and his life and light and power. To proclaim good news to the poor. To bind up the brokenhearted. Where might the Lord be calling you today? You know, we started with that promise of Jesus that it's good that he goes. But he made another promise, sort of equally as unbelievable and bizarre. And he says this. He says, greater works will you do than I did because I go to be with the Father. Now, there's all sort of debate among theologians as to whether or not that sort of quality or quantity is that one person or all people. And I think in some ways, I don't really mind which it is. What I love is the very first word of that. What does it say? Whoever, whoever, who's that verse addressed to? Whoever, whoever believes in me will have the spirit and greater works they will do. If you are sat here, you believe in Jesus, you're included. You are the whoever. And I think that Jesus knew that we'd struggle to get our head around this, which is why he starts with like, very truly, I tell you. He's like, hey guys, pay attention to this. I'm being honest, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me and the works that I do, 
greater works will they do? But I love the way that Eugene Peterson puts this, the writer of the Message Bible. A man who gave his entire life, committed his entire life to just studying the scriptures, understanding them, getting around them, understanding the, you know, the original context, the promises. And he said this, it is the conviction of the Bible that absolutely everything in scripture is livable. It is the conviction of the Bible that absolutely everything in scripture is livable. Or as one other theologian put it, the spirit is there to make the impractical practicable. The impractical practicable. But let's step back for a second. Right? Let's move away from metaphor and promise and motif and theme and illustration and illusion. And let's become incredibly practical right now. What does this mean for me, for you, here today in Emmaus. And I'd understand if you were like, Adam, you're saying that this is better. I don't feel better. If this is the promise, then I'm going to be honest, I feel a little underwhelmed. You're talking about creating this new world. You're talking about speaking to a valley of dry bones. And if I'm honest, I just can't stop looking at pornography. If I'm honest, I can't even seem to get over my social anxiety. If I'm honest, I can't seem to get the confidence to even speak up at a meeting at work. If I'm honest, my family feels like it's in a bla- not a very great place right now. If I'm honest, I'm just struggling to make ends meet. Or even, Adam, I've been here before. I've got all riled up on the power of the Spirit before, and I've been disappointed. And I think... To you, I would say you're not alone. The famous preacher Billy Graham said this. He said, everywhere I go, I find that God's people lack something. They are hungry for something. Their Christian experience is not all they had expected, and they often have reoccurring defeat in their lives. Christians today are hungry for spiritual fulfillment. The desperate need of the nation today is that men and women who profess Jesus be filled with the Holy Spirit. This man, this evangelist, who spoke to thousands of people, traveled around, went to every different type of church and geography, denomination, and at the end of it all, his conviction was this, the believer needs the Spirit. And so how do we respond Well, I want to dare you as we go through this over the next seven weeks to press in again. And to remember that fundamentally and most importantly, the spirit is not a force to be wielded, but a person to know and be known by. The secret to being filled with the power of the spirit is not information or incantation, it's intimacy. The spirit is a person. And the only way you get to know a person is through time and commitment and intentionality. So over the next seven weeks, as we look at the story of what the Spirit empowered the church to do, I want to challenge you to get to know the person of the Spirit again, afresh, to make time to get to know the person of the Spirit. Maybe there's places in your life where you're honest, you just think about the Spirit as just a force, a sort of ethereal thing that drifts around that occasionally makes people do slightly weird things. Christianity Today did a poll, and 51% of people said that they believe that the Spirit is a force and not a person. Most of the church in America have got confused and believe that the third person of the Trinity is simply some ethereal, abstract thing out in the ether. And no wonder we don't live in the power of the Spirit, but the Spirit is a person to know and be known by. But to do that, we need to remember that he is the Holy spirit. And the Bible says that we can quench the spirit through our actions, through the way that we live. Sin is this thing that has the unique ability to crowd out our experience of the presence of God. But I think we so often misunderstand what this means. So often we sort of picture the spirit as like skittish or nervous. 
And whenever there's something that's not perfect in our life, like he sort of runs away because he's worried about it. But that's not what happens at all. What happens in sin isn't so much that God turns away from us, but that we turn away from God. Augustine, the great church father, said that sin is incurvatus in se, which means that sin is the human being curved in on itself. So what happens in sin is that we begin to curve in on ourselves and we actually stop to look towards the presence of God. He gets crowded out. He gets moved away. And how do I know this? Well, one of the primary names given to the spirit is advocate. It's hard to be an advocate for someone if you always believe they're perfect. In his very name, one of his primary names is his mission to be the person who steps in and speaks on our behalf against the accuser. The spirit is not scared of your sin, but what happens in sin is we turn away from the spirit. We curve in on ourselves. So over the next seven weeks, maybe we just need to look up again. Just turn our face again towards the presence of God, again towards the spirit. Because in the same way that the Bible says that we can quench the spirit, it also says that we can fan the spirit into flame. And one of the ways we do that is this, the gathered environment held together by the spirit where we open the scriptures, we feast on the promises of God, we worship his presence, we invite his spirit to come and we fan into fame the spirit among us and in us. I've got a friend called Pete Portal. And he is working with uh, gangsters and drug addicts in one of the townships in South Africa. And I remember he said one day, to just survive in that place, he has to have a personal Pentecost every morning. And what he does is he looks in the mirror and he remembers the Ruach, the Spirit of God. And he breathes in and he remembers the Spirit is with him. And I'm going to be 100% honest as I was preparing this. I realized that there was times in my life that I was more expectant than I am now for the Spirit. There was times in my life where I was more intentionally aware, more attentive to the spirits moving. And then life gets busy. It's a big church to run. There's a family. There's chores to do. There's uniforms to get ready on a night. There's kids to play with. There's emails to be sent. And somewhere along the line, if I'm honest, I became satisfied with information over intimacy. But with any relationship, information is a pitiful replacement for experience. And so as we go into response now, I'm going to be honest, I'm going to be the first person on the front saying, Lord Jesus, I recommit right now to being aware of your spirit, to having a personal Pentecost moment with you every morning, to remember that as I breathe in, I breathe in the very spirit that brought Jesus back from the dead, to remember that the conviction of the Bible is that every single thing in Scripture is livable, to remember that maybe Jesus was right and maybe truly, maybe better really is available. And so maybe we could jump to our feet right now. We've got a little bit longer to respond. And I believe we're going to respond in a number of ways. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you've been following Jesus for a while. And if you're honest, there's times and seasons in your life when you paid more attention to the Spirit of God. Maybe there's times and seasons in your life you made more time to be with the Spirit. And you're still good at reading your Bible or whatever, but actually you've stopped becoming aware of His presence with you. Stop being attentive to walking with Him. Stop taking the risk to pray for people or to speak out or to use your voice. Or maybe you've never experienced the Spirit. Maybe right now you're quite new to this journey and you don't have any memory of this thing. And we want to pray for you this morning. There's a ministry team. And so as the band begins to play and leads us into ministry, we're just going to take a moment right now. Let's all stand to our feet. Maybe hold out your hands together. This sense of receiving something encountering someone. Everything we're going to look at over the next seven weeks is kind of noise and chatter unless we understand that it's through the Spirit that this all becomes possible. And so maybe right now what you want to do is come forward. There's a team here of people that we trust who'd love to pray for you. 
And it's just again to come before God, to come before the Spirit and say, Spirit, I turn my attentions, my affections towards you. I make space for you. I become aware of your presence again. Sorry for times that I've become busy, distracted, unaware. I've been focusing on things that may be less important. Maybe right now, actually, you're feeling great. Maybe right now you're in a great place with the Spirit. And actually what I believe the Lord is going to do now is he's going to speak to you about some places that he's going to call you to. What is the place of darkness, disorder, where the Spirit is the answer and you're the person that the the Lord is sending? And so, Lord Jesus, Father, Spirit, triune God, We thank you, God. We thank you for thousands of years that came together at that moment in Pentecost. We thank you for the tongues of fire that rested on each person. We thank you that every person is called to be a walking dwelling place of the literal presence of the divine God. We thank you for the spirit that blew above creation, for the spirit that was breathed into the valley of dry bones, for the spirit that was promised by Jesus and the spirit that arrived as a violent wind in Pentecost. Lord Jesus, break us out of our apathy. Give us the courage to believe again the promises that greater works, greater works are we called to because your spirit is here and your spirit is inside each and every one of us. Amen. 